reply. Thank you, folks. Um, can we hear that? Great. So glad, uh, so glad you could make it. Uh, this is a wonderful turnout. Thank you. Great room, too. So what can I tell you about me? Uh, a little bit more. I came here seven years ago to Washington, and I told a group recently that I was basically brought to Washington in 2007, I don't know, to kind of irritate people who were supporters of what would become the Affordable Care Act. And last year, I decided I would broaden my horizon and look for a job where I could irritate supporters and opponents of the Affordable Care Act. And that's kind of what I do, because what I've concluded over time with my research is that we've had a long debate about nothing, kind of the Seinfeld debate, for those old enough to remember Seinfeld. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think we really haven't had much of a health care debate on what's really important, how we can get there, and how some of you can cross the aisles and actually find some commonality which has been in all too short a supply in Washington for a long, long, long time. And by long time, I would say at least going back to the 1940s, and I, would, I could argue if I were to wax on such things that back to the 1910s. But let's talk a little bit about it. What am I going to do today? Let me give you a little bit of a road map, but not too much. So I'm going to argue there's been no real debate on what's important. And I'm going to talk about what I think is the real divide, the true divide in healthcare policy in America. And it's not left, right, Democratic, Republican, federal, state, all the usual suspects that you hear on the evening news. Rather, it's something that I call the fortress and the frontier. The fortress is, uh, let's say, a place, a, um, an environment in which, uh, which is risk averse, fearful of risk, and where insiders are protected from newcomers. The frontier, on the other hand, is tolerant of risk. And I'm just going to turn this around a little bit. Uh, tolerant of risk. And insiders uh, have to compete for their daily bread with newcomers. Now, what else? The, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the frontier in other industries, because I can argue that healthcare is the least innovative major industry in America and has been for decades. And we're going to talk about why that is. I'm going to compare it with computing, which has probably been the most, along with telecommunications, the most innovative. Uh, and we're going to meet some innovators that I've had a chance to meet in recent uh, days in healthcare that give you hope that things actually can change. We can actually accomplish some things that are, have sort of previously been unimagined. Change the way the world looks at healthcare and how we deal with it. Uh, we're going to look at what's stopping innovation, and we're going to ask, how can we stop, in, stop that stopping? How can we allow innovation to proceed apace? Um, I was having a conversation yesterday about innovation in healthcare, and someone was asking, what do you mean that healthcare is the least innovative? And it's a long answer, but I, I came up with kind of a shorthand version, which is, imagine going back to talk to your grandfather, great-grandfather, whatever, in, uh, you know, someone in their mid-70s or above, 40 years ago, and try to explain to them telecommunications today. Explain the internet. Explain Kindle. Explain all of those things that we have. Can't do it. You could never get the conversation, even if you could tie this person down and have hours and hours explaining the internet and such. At the end, they would say, I don't believe it. You could go back and explain just about everything in healthcare. There have been a lot of miracles invented, a lot of really astounding things, but basically it would have been all comprehensible 40 to 50 years ago. And I think just as a shorthand, that's a way to think about, well, maybe technological innovation isn't proceeding as quickly in healthcare as in other fields. And there are more scientific ways of putting it. But let's go on. What we have had in this building and across the country is a long debate, at least back to the 1940s, between two sides. One side, you could capture it almost entirely in a bumper sticker that says universal coverage. Certainly, that notion was at the very heart of the Affordable Care Act. And I'm not here to slam that either. It's a vision. It's something that inspires a lot of people. So that has been, that's been one side of the debate. And I would argue 
that the other side of the debate has responded with something that looks kind of like this. That this would be their bumper sticker if they chose to put it on. Long-winded, lots of process, lots of institutions, uh, and a couple of things about this. This is a message that will never bring an audience to its feet. It will never get you an applause line. And furthermore, I will argue that if you somehow manage to get every single item on that list and the others that are on the usual suspect think tank and congressional alternative health care plans, you could pass them all today and get the president to sign it. I don't think it would make a tremendous difference in the shape of American health care. This is an alternative. So one of my colleagues said, well, let's see, we've got these other two here. So you can sum it up even more, more uh, succinctly. This is one side of the argument. This is the other side of the argument. And that's kind of where we stand. And it's not a debate. It's uh, a point and an acquiescence. And I would argue that what we're really seeing here is, let's see if I get this right. We're having an argument over whether we should be here or whether we should be here, when in fact, we should be here, and I'm going to talk today about where that is. So we have the fortress. The fortress, again, is my word for the, um, the environment in healthcare in which we are very protective, we're very cautious. Uh, insiders at the top of the profession are defended by, the, by our institutions, by our laws, by our regulations, and by a lot of private, private sector institutions like medical boards as well, medical societies. And the other side is the frontier. This is the place, this is where computers have been that have changed our lives over the last 50 years. Uh, the world has changed in shipping, in transportation, in communications, in computing, in all of these fields, just not in healthcare, and I would argue probably not in education, and for exactly the same reasons. So what are some sort of um, archetypes of, uh, of the fortress frontier? The frontier might be something like this. Uh, there was uh, some years back, there was a middle level hedge fund manager on Wall Street who one day packed up his briefcase and walked out of his office, went west, stuffed some books in his garage and started peddling them uh, out of there. It was Jeff Bezos, Amazon.com. And the interesting thing to note about him is there is not a financial analyst, a retail analyst, or anyone else in the United States who ever would have said, that's the guy who's going to absolutely change the entire world, the way we shop, the way we buy, the way we sell, the way we do everything. No one would have said it. Um, this is an example of the fortress. You've got healthcare.gov. And again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time today picking on the ACA. It will be no secret. I'm not keen on the law. On the other hand, as I will argue, I'm not keen on most of the alternatives that have been put forth either. This was supposed to be the, the, the parlance in sales was this is going to be the Amazon.com of healthcare. What it failed to understand was, it was risk averse and it was insider driven. You cannot, there was no one in America who could have said, why there's Jeff Bezos, he, let's let him develop Amazon.com. That fails to understand that for every Jeff Bezos, there are probably a thousand others who developed similar sites, which would have, some of which would have been pretty good alternatives to Amazon, but they didn't make it because one rose to the top. This was an attempt to look out in the crowd and find a Jeff Bezos and say, you'll be the one to develop it. And that, more than anything else, is what went wrong and still goes wrong with healthcare.gov. And lest anyone doubt it, the front end is kind of fixed, the back end is as disastrous as it was in October. But again, I don't want to spend the time today bashing the ACA because things were bad before the ACA. And a lot of the institutions in the United States, the, some of the worst excesses are at the state level. And I will say, and I'll stress a couple times, some of the worst excesses at the state level are in states that would think of themselves as free market, kind of uh, more on the conservative side, 
My own state of Virginia has what's called a Certificate of Public Need program. If you are an innovator and you want to build a brand new hospital in Virginia, you've got to go beg permission of the state and you're going to be begging permission from people who are well connected with the people who are running the hospital, the old, dusty, wheezing hospital down the road from you. And if they say, well, no, we don't really think we need another hospital, you don't build it. And not only that, in the state of Virginia, not only, you can't, not, it's not only a matter of building a new hospital, if you want to add some new beds to your, your current hospital, you've got to ask permission. If you want to buy a CAT scan machine and bring it into Virginia, say, I think our hospital really could use another CAT scan machine, the state is perfectly entitled under the law to say, I'm sorry, there's a, you know, the big wheezing old hospital, they got plenty of CAT scan machines, so we don't think we need any more of these. And that's just one regulation out of hundreds. So let's see. Problems predated the ACA. If you're looking for an iconic example of it, you can do better, no better than this one. VA, Veterans Affairs Healthcare, defining excellence in the 21st century. Is there anyone who wants to put that bumper sticker on their car today? And I don't mean to VA bash. I've, I, I teach and I've got a lot of students who are medical professionals at the VA. They are as dedicated as anyone on earth. They are as competent as anyone on earth. What you have is an institution that is a problem. And what's wrong with the VA is exactly what's wrong with the rest of the healthcare system and this missing debate that we have, which is we have focused, at least since the 1940s, on one issue. Go back to that universal coverage bumper sticker. That is a process bumper sticker that says the most important thing on the face of the earth is how many people have a health insurance card in their wallet. Yeah, I, I like having an insurance card in my wallet. It's not the most important thing. What it misses is the human beings. The healthcare debate, I will argue, should not be about coverage. It should not be about insurance cards. It should be about humans and improving health. And we can get there. This is a procession of computers from the 1960s till now. In 1965, all computers on Earth you know, would have filled, probably not quite this room, but a large room. They would have cost in excess of a million dollars. And they would have had about the computing power of your average Hallmark singing Christmas card. In 1965, the DEC company, which many of you will never heard of because it is now long gone, the Digital Equipment Corporation produced the PDP-8, which was a $19,000 computer, a little bit bigger than this podium. Was it as good as this one? No, it didn't have the same computing power. But what it ena enabled to do is instead of a couple of companies with giant computers, all of a sudden there were lots of companies with modest-sized computers. And then the computers started improving as people in this business said, you know, we've got a new use for this computer that we never thought of. No one else has ever thought of it. Now, the, in, the fascinating thing about the innovative process is to think about how rapidly it can proceed if it's allowed to. The PDP-8 came out in 1965. Less than a decade later, it would start meeting its end as the newer creations, the Apple, the Microsoft machines, began to come online barely a decade later. Actually, slightly less than a decade later, Microsoft and Apple were founded. At the time the PDP-8 came out, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates were nine and ten years old. Now, one thing we miss out in healthcare is the spark of genius that comes from extreme youth. That's where most of history's great inventions come from, the very young. In medicine, you're way out into your middle 30s or later before you're even allowed to begin doing this. Today, an iPhone is more powerful than any computer that existed on the face of the earth as recently as 1985. So you can go to third world villages and every kid is carrying around a little cell phone in the pocket 
that is more powerful than anything, the Central Intelligence Agency or anyone else, the supercomputers that existed when I started my job as an economist in New York. And what happens after you get to that point? You start getting the apps, you start getting innovation, people out of nowhere, college kids dropping out of school to form billion dollar companies. These things have changed your life. As I said, if, you were, if someone were to say today, we're gonna take it all away and you're gonna go back to 1970s communication, your current life would be lost. You wouldn't know how to function. And again, the same's not true in healthcare. You'd be a little peeved that they don't have the beta blocker or the MRI machine, whatever, but you could still kind of survive it and it would all look fairly familiar to you. But this world has completely changed, and I would argue for the most part it has changed your life incredibly for the better. I will argue, for instance, that, j that Jobs and Gates have probably saved more lives than any thousand doctors on earth when you think of all the people whose lives have been saved by having OnStar or being able to email, I'm in trouble, or having, uh, having telemetry around their neck signaling a hospital, this guy is having a heart attack, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the genius here is, again, no one knows where these things are gonna come from. And when you look at the individual stories of who innovates these apps, you realize it is a strangely, if not random, it's a highly mysterious process. And if you want the counter thought, imagine what it would be if we had, if the FDA were the Federal Department of Apps that had to approve every app that went on the internet. And believe me, it sounds like a joke, you could justify it. You could say, if you go back to the mid, early 1990s and say, well, I don't know, we, we need to slow down because people could use this internet thing to steal money and to invade people's privacy and to go into their bank accounts. So whatever. We really need to spend about 15 years checking out each app and making sure that it works beautifully. And right now, we would still be decades behind the internet would be essentially non-existent. John Cochran, a professor of economics at the University of Chicago, asked a question, what's the biggest thing we could do to bend the cost curve, as well as finally tackle the ridiculous inefficiency and consequent low quality of healthcare delivery? John Cochran's answer to his own question was, Look for every limit on supply of healthcare services, especially entry by new companies, and get rid of it. And there is where your possibilities come in. And again, even your possibilities of walking across and shaking hands with someone on the other side of the aisle and actually finding something to agree upon and something to accomplish. Okay, I've talked about computers, but can you, does this really work in healthcare? Again, I teach students, I teach medical professionals, and I'm often you know, told, well, but healthcare is different. Uh, my friend David Goldhill, who wrote a wonderful book called Catastrophic Care, How American Healthcare Killed My Father and How We Can Fix It, despite the sort of bizarre title, is a wonderful book uh, by a really brilliant fellow who is, by the way, not in the healthcare industry. He's CEO of the Game Show Network but he looks at healthcare the same way he looks at his own industry. Um, David says healthcare is different because we've decided it's different. And I spend about six months with my students beating them into submission thinking, yeah, that's the big difference. We have decided that it's different. And as I note with them, there's an awful lot of fields of endeavor, electricians, engineers, plumbers, food handlers, everyone else, airplane pilots who have your life in their hand, what they do is a matter of life and death, every bit as much as what your doctor does, but somehow, for reasons, sociological reasons, we tend to think there's something absolutely unique and special about, uh, about healthcare that makes it different from everything else. And if, I, if you ask me to argue that it is, I could probably do that too, but, but more, mostly I'm convinced it's not that different from other fields. It's important, it's intimate, it's close, and I think that's part of the reason we think of it so differently. And, um, and it is that sense that we have that it's different that slows us down. And there's an interesting thing, and again, when I talk about this crossing the aisles idea, 
It's something I've noted over my 16 years as teaching graduate school. And again, my students are medical professionals, doctors on down. Um, I have a lot of doctors and others in my classes who, when I get to talk to them, you know, th this guy would be a solid conservative and libertarian, except on healthcare, where absolutely, let's have central control and a national healthcare system and whatever. I will have another student over here who is way on the left on most issues for central control of everything in life, but basically says, I want the government out of my health care. It's too intimate, too private. There is a strange disconnect between the ideologies that people have uh, on most things and the ideology that they have in health care. And I think that this disconnect is part of the problem that we've had with the health care debate here on Capitol Hill and across the country. Because we're trying, we have push legislation that tries to squeeze you into where you seem like you ought to be. Okay, you're kind of a Republican guy. Here's a plan that kind of looks like a Republican would come up with it, and the same on the Democratic side. And I think that's a major obstruction, and it is a solvable problem. So the question is, is it that different? Well, let me give you a small case to show that the same processes are capable of working in healthcare. This is Richard von Oss a carpenter woodworker in South Africa who one Saturday afternoon chopped his fingers off while working the table saw. He decided in the emergency room he was going to make something good come of it. Somehow in his research he contacts Ivan Owen who is a puppet maker in Bellingham, Washington famous for making his exotic hands for his puppets. And he said, you know, is there anything, do you think you could build me a hand that would work? Right now I can't do my, my work because I no longer have a hand. There are, there are commercially made, in this country, FDA approved hands like the B-Bionic 3, which costs $30,000. In general, they cost between twenty-five dollars and $80,000. And Ivan Owen apparently had always had kind of a fantasy of doing this, of building prosthetics and helping people with bad injuries or born without. And what they came up with was a 3D printed hand, a $2,000 3D printer, producing a hand that costs probably somewhere in the order of five to ten dollars in raw materials and requires a couple of hours of assembly time that a, and there's a little video out that I love to show people, of a ten-year-old assembling it. And in fact, this is a 3D printed hand. With one of these, a person born without fingers or who's missing them can uh, ride a bike, play badminton, um, pick up things. If I want to pick up the water bottle, etc. cetera. Um, I don't have the grip quite right here. One of the fingers needs a little adjustment, but basically you can pick it up. I could do it with a can. Um, these change lives at a cost of virtually nothing. Now, your insurance will pay something toward the expensive ones. You'll still end up paying in five figures if you need one, and if you break it, you're gonna have to spend maybe for the whole thing, or maybe again, five figures. Uh, if you grow, if you're a child, you're gonna have to keep buying these things over and over. But with these, you break it, you lose it, you drop it, you outgrow it, you go to the printer, you print a new one. That's one small item in the entire menu of healthcare. We are on the verge of what's been called a Cambrian explosion of hundreds or thousands of innovations, just as impressive, if not more so. Just this one happens to be one. It's kind of hard to argue with it, and it's awfully obvious. And if you go to, um, to the Enable website, enablingthefuture.org, or if you go to their Facebook page, e-enable, um, you will, I will tell you to have some handkerchiefs because it's awfully emotional to watch these children born without hands suddenly being fitted with something that finally allows them to live a normal life. And the great thing about this is, so this is John Schull, a fellow I've gotten to know electronically and I will meet next week when he comes for a visit. 
He's a professor at Rochester Institute of Technology in the School of Interactive Games and Media, which I love the fact that there is such a school <laughs> at the university. Anyway, John started connecting people with this. He became very interested in this. And John began to connect people, saying, okay, you need a hand, and I've met someone over here who wants to build one, and you don't live too far apart. And finally, he said it was, got very exhausting. So he just opened a Google Plus group and immediately had hundreds of people joining it, people who needed hands, people who wanted to build hands. And now he's got over 1,000 people in this consortium worldwide. You can go on, on the web and join it today. Um, I'm actually looking into the possibility of helping them out. Um, and the great thing is, the hand is evolving. I've got another one at home uh, that was kind of broken when it arrived and was malfunctioning. It got damaged in shipping. It's much bigger, clunkier looking. But what you've got is people all over the world, the same people who would be developing Facebook and Google in another realm, are saying, gee, I like this. This is kind of cool. I want to work on the hand. Make them smaller. Make them more human-like. This, I mean, this one looks actually pretty reasonable. The other ones were these big, square, clunky things, which worked, but they, they look sort of odd. Um, and they're taking new forms. They're evolving just as iPad apps evolve. There's a film he's got of a little small child who was missing his whole arm and said, uh, how, okay, you, you help us design your arm. What do you want in it? And the kid said, I can't reach anything. I want an arm that's twice as long as a regular arm. And they said, well, why not? We can do that. <laughs> so they built him a short one and a long one. So if he needs to reach something, he slaps on the long arm and reaches up. Those are not sort of things that a committee of PhDs in their mid-40s to 60s would think of. This is something that's spontaneous. Uh, that's the marvel of this. Um, and I'll stress one of the great things about this, for the first time in years since I've been doing healthcare, I'm actually dealing with people and I don't know their politics and I don't care. I happen to know John and I have somewhat different politics. We've talked about that. It doesn't matter, because in this realm, we're out on the same. I'm going to give you a real quick pick. So, let's say you have your member represents a rural area that has shortages of doctors. The Affordable Care Act isn't going to get that fixed. Nor are any of the more conservative plans out there. They're not designed that. For, they're designed to get insurance cards to up the demand and completely, absolutely, totally ignore the supply side of healthcare markets. So what do you do? You've got a shortage, you've got a couple of doctors stressed to try to serve a rural area. And I'll add, um, let's say, if we want to, to do some stereotyping, and I do it purposefully because this actually is part of these plans. Uh, a Latino community that feels underserved and somewhat isolated from the medical system, uh, as many do. This is Ian Shaquille, who was asked to try Google Glass, immediately quit his job, started a new company called Augmetics that you can look up. And Augmetics is a Google Glass app. So I'm your doctor. You come in for a, uh, a checkup. I've got Google Glass, and before you come in, they say, do you mind if the doctor uses this? 99% of patients say, sure. So the doctor talks to you the entire time you're there. The doctor never turns around and touches a computer, never has to be filling in emergency health records. Live, real-time streaming to their back office, which is assembling an electronic health record in real time. By the time you and the doctor are through, it's ready. If you say, doctor, could I have that record? He said, absolutely, punches a button and there's a printout, you've got it. Using this, a doctor can double the number of patients he or she can see in a day, or can double the time spent with each patient. Or, as Ian noted, the doctor can play more golf. And he said, and I don't care which of the three it is, if it makes the patients and the doctors happier, it's great. 
So right now you've raised the potential of doubling the medical supply in that rural area without doing anything. Um, this is Pat Basu, Doctor on Demand. Pat, uh, interesting character, he was a White House fellow last year. Uh, he's got this uh, telemedicine company out in San Francisco, operates nationwide, he's got medical licenses in 29 states. Let's say you are in that Latino community and you're a migrant worker and you are suddenly finding yourself off in Florida, thousands of miles from your home, you've never really had much interaction with the healthcare system, you don't much trust the healthcare system, you don't speak much English, etc. You go to Pat's app, bang, in seconds there is a doctor, a Spanish speaking doctor, talking to you, giving you a full checkup, and in probably three-fourths of the cases, you do not need a follow-up. They can determine enough using telemedicine uh, that, um, that they can figure what's wrong and treat you. Using that, you can imagine, okay, if it's a 75% thing, you got one doctor in the rural community, now you've got four doctors, essentially, because 75% of the time it's someone in California dealing with it, or someone else. And by the way, if you do need a doctor, and they say, no, you really need to see someone in person, click, uh, we, we have someone in our network who's 10 miles away from you, here's the address, get there fast, your child is sick. Now, I will tell you some of the worst impediments to telemedicine, again, are in states, Texas, Tennessee, Alabama, Arkansas, et cetera, that have thrown up obstacles to this. Oddly, um, states like California and New York aren't too obtrusive in this. It's a very, it's a, again, there are very funny switches in healthcare. Uh, and finally, Jenna Treegarthen, a remarkable young woman who came from Australia because she wanted to innovate in healthcare. She invented an app for people with eating disorders. She now has 8,000 counselors and 150,000 patients worldwide is having the greatest success and the whole basis of it is eating disorders are terrible to fight and the worst thing about it, and she found this out from a friend of hers with a severe eating disorder, is all therapy consists of meticulous record keeping over and over and over and over and over. And um, she has an app that does it for you, so it's not so tiring. There's a whole world of other things coming. We are on the verge of having 3D printed organs, but the fortress is moving to stop them. Drugs that are designed for you, but not for you or you, even if you've got the same illness, matched to your DNA. The FDA's techniques of, uh, of evaluating drugs are entirely inappropriate for this sort of a world. Wearable telemetry, so you're constantly, your doctor is getting a constant feed of your blood pressure, etc. Nanobots that can go in your body and fix damaged genes. Use of social media to crowdsource innovation. New data mining techniques, lean production techniques, bio sniffers that will let you know all about your own vulnerabilities. So how do we get there? Where do you come in? Um, the approach has been, let's write a big thousand, two thousand, three thousand page law and slam dunk the whole thing all at once. That's the ECA approach. Most of the alternatives are, let's us come up with a nice thinner little bill uh, that'll, that'll you know, get rid of that one and do the trick. And I don't think, I think the idea of trying to do all of these fixes in one piece of legislation is a disastrous notion and it doesn't matter which side of the aisle it's coming from. Um, so I thought it's more like World War II Pacific Theater warfare. Thousands of little islands, do them one at a time. You can use uh, a military historian I told this to said, do you do island hopping where you fix this and then you go slightly here and you go slightly here? Or do you do leapfrogging where you look at this one, fix this one, look around and say, there's a vulnerable one and go over here. I said, well, in World War II we used both, so why not use them both here? And there are lots of different places you can do this. You're attacking small problems in the healthcare system rather than gigantic ones. Taming pieces of the FDA. You're not going to tame the whole FDA at once. But you can say, well, here's a regulation that horribly impedes innovation in this area. 
fix that one. And reform Medicare reimbursement, island by island. Um, you're not going to fix the whole Medicare system, but you can say, well, the pricing of these procedures, say in urology, make no sense, let's fix those. Reform Medicaid the same way. At the state level, allowing specialty hospitals, eliminating certificate of need, you can go one state at a time, one chunk of the regulation at a time. Scope of practice regulation, saying let's expand what nurse practitioners can do. There are 18 states that allow them to have independent practices. They seem to do fine, let, them, let it work in other states. The medical school curriculum I could go into is basically a 100-year-old model that is way out of date. It stops uh, critical thinking and it stops interdisciplinary cooperation, which is where all these great innovations come from. The right to Try, go see Dallas Buyers Club if you haven't watched it. It's a fantastic movie on this. And Right to Know, 23andMe, a little home genetic testing kit, spit into a cup, mail it to them, they send you back information on your genes on about 250 different things, your vulnerabilities. Well, maybe you're facing the possibility of alcoholism or uh, obesity or this or that, whatever. Uh, the FDA said, stop selling this. That's, you know, the consumer, the patient is not entitled to know this information. That's only for the higher ups, the doctors in the fortress. And if you're one of those who's kind of irritated at the treatment Uber's getting, it's the same issue. So here's the fortress, and I'm picking on the FDA. It's only one fortress. There are a lot of them in town here. Um, if you're looking for a bumper sticker instead of that wordy, wordy alternative, or the universal coverage one, or the little gray one, try this one, Innovate Health. This is how we get the costs down. This is how we save people how we relieve suffering, how we save lives. And that, that's how you fix health care. And that's it. Thanks, folks. <laughs> Q&A.